I'm now here at uh, uh, in Chesnadia, Romania, and we've been looking in uh, the book of Daniel, and so we're going to continue um, going back up just a little bit. Um, we already covered Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Um, just came across some, uh, it, part of it's recent information, uh, but on the other hand, it's also information from centuries ago. Um, I guess rediscovered information. Uh, it talks about, uh, been debated about who King Darius was. Uh, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Um, and uh, a lot of people wondered who this uh, King Darius was. Uh, there's no record in history outside the Bible. Now, I take a little issue with that uh, because uh, the, the Bible has been proven uh, to be true over and over and over. Um, people talk about, well, uh, there's no proof uh, outside the Bible, well, they'll find a, another text somewhere and they will take it for gospel in, uh, in a sense. Um, of course, there's one gospel, but uh, isn't it uh, true that we use that term, gospel, as being true? And so uh, uh, they, they will accept that before they will the Bible. Uh, however, the Bible, like I say, it's it's proven itself over and over through archaeological discoveries. Uh, one thing after another, people have said, well, uh, you know, we can't find anything in secular history about this or that, and so it must not be true. Uh, this person, no such thing. One time they said there was no such people as Hittites, and now it's well known. Uh, a while back they discovered the the whole uh, kingdom of the Hittites and uh, just how uh, powerful they was there, were there at one time. Um, so anyway, uh, Darius here, uh, there's no outside the Bible and so many people reject that he really lived and it really was true. Um, people said the thing, same thing about Belshazzar, but uh, there's been uh, clay tablets and um, uh, cylinders and things found that not only proved that uh, he existed, that he was the son of Nabonidus, and uh, Nabonidus uh, made him king along with himself. And so uh, Be um, Belshazzar ruled over the kingdom of, uh, of Babylon, the province of Babylon, while Nab Nabonidus ruled over the whole empire. Um, and so one thing, this Darius, I found some more information on it. Uh, through a paper someone had written a thesis um, a few years back, uh, and um, just a few years ago. And um, this is one of the things that he um, proposed, and uh, it sounds as good as any. Um, according to this, uh, and I'm, I'll share it with you, um, a lot of people at one time uh, there is a uh, Greek historian called uh, Xenophon that uh, some of the early uh, church fathers and uh, had uh, relied upon for uh, historical information um, <clears throat> but somewhere along the line um, the people started going more to Herodotus. Um, and uh, this man that wrote this um, article uh, suggests that Xenophon's history is more accurate than uh, Herodotus in most cases. So, uh, <clears throat> according to him, uh, the Medes and Persians, we used to think, and, and the scripture tells us that, uh, the Medes were the uh, first um, rulers between the Medes and Persians. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, usually when it gives the order, like Medes and Persians, and that indicates that Medes, the Medes were the superior power um, in that. They were very connected people because King Cyrus 
uh, his um, <clears throat> um, some say his uh, grandfather and some say his uncle um, was king of uh, the Medes. So there was a, a close connection there between the two groups and, and they were neighbors um, there in the, the part of Iran. Um, most people have uh, assumed that um, Cyrus took over the Medes and, and overcame them before he conquered Babylon. <clears throat> but it looks like uh, it's very possible now that, uh, according to this uh, gentleman, that uh, the Persians did not become the greater power. You remember there was uh, the ram with two horns, and there was the uh, first horn, and then there was the second horn that came up that was uh, get got to be bigger. And, of course, second horn is Persia, but when did that second horn become the bigger horn? Uh, that's 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 the question that's the issue that this man raises, and um, so um, most people have assumed that King Cyrus uh, conquered Babylon, uh, but historical records mostly agree that uh, uh, Cyrus was not there when Babylon fell. Uh, he came in uh, a few weeks later, uh, and so um, it appears that. And according, that's according to this Xenophon, the Greek historian, um, that um, Darius was a uh, throne name of someone else. Now, some people con con conjectured that uh, uh, that was another name. That was maybe Cyrus's throne name. But... Um, uh, that's, um, I don't think that can be the case, and we looked at that earlier. Um, but according to, the, to uh, Xiphon, Xenophon, um, the Medes were still, had the um, primary place between the Medes and the Persians when they conquered Babylon. And so Darius was actually the... Um, the ruler between the two. Uh, Cyrus uh, was a powerful uh, general for the Persians, and uh, it's said that I think he married um, uh, into the family of um, Darius. Uh, and that happened a lot, um, where they made uh, treaties and... and uh, by intermarriage like that, that uh, between the kingdoms, and it kept them at peace, and they uh, worked together uh, most of the time. Uh, so we see that um, what uh, Xenophon uh, seems to indicate was that uh, Darius, and we know that Darius ruled for about two years, is all he ruled. Well, when he died, he did not have um, anyone succeed him, uh, but since uh, Cyrus was married to his daughter, then Cyrus, the, the kingdom fell to him. And that's when the Persians became the primary uh, power uh, there. So uh, anyway, I uh, want to throw that out there. That's something that I've never seen before, uh, but it seems to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, like I say, there's a lot of different um, conjectures on it. Uh, but uh, it talked about Darius, the son of Hazarius. Now, uh, so many times people in the Bible had uh, were known by different names, and sometimes they were thrown names. Sometimes they were names because they were mentioned in a different language, and so they're they're different in different languages, um, and so. Uh, uh, that's another reason, but uh, in Hezraeus is known as Xerxes in um, in secular um, terminology. Uh, so Cyrus shared uh, power with uh, you know that Median king, um, and uh, his, his actually his name was um, called Cyaxerxes by the Greek historian Xenophon but is known by his throne name, Darius. So that's who 
This device was, uh, evidently was Cyaxerxes known in the secular world there. And so that, to me, solves the mystery of, of this Darius, uh, who he really was. Uh, and so I wanted to, didn't mean to take so much time on it, but I wanted to, to clarify that and go back and just throw that out there. Um, <clears throat> and, and we know that early on that uh, you see it written in the scriptures, they're called, uh, you know, the Medes and the Persian, which indicates that the Medes were the the stronger power at that time. And like I say later, that went to Persia. Now let, we, we got through um, verse seven down to verse eight uh, last time. And so let's hurry and uh, pick up there. Um, Daniel begins his, um, or he's already started his uh, plea uh, to um, uh, God and, and a plea of repentance. And he began to pour his heart out uh, to God here. And so, uh, we'll see that uh, in verse 5, uh, as he's praying, and he, he begins to repent and, uh, of the sins of the nation. And he, he says, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled. And we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Uh, and so um, Daniel, even though he was probably 15 years old at the time, and, and when he got to Babylon, when he was taken captive, and when he got to Babylon, he was a godly young man. Uh and I said before, he may have been 15 when he got there, but he was a man. Um, and so uh, uh, he's more of a man than uh, a lot of older, um, stout, strong, uh, physically people that I've known. Um, and so, uh, yeah, he was a young man to me, uh, but he probably was about 15 years old. Uh, and yet he's repenting for all the sins of the, the nation and identifying with the sins of the nation. And, and uh, it says, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. And that's in verse 7. So, And then again, he identifies here in verse 8 as we begin to pick up. He says, To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Uh, he, he says there, um, open shame. That's, I think, the second time he mentioned that. Um, one place... Uh, when they were still in the land, uh, uh, either I think it's Jeremiah, maybe that uh, talked about that they couldn't, they had no shame, they couldn't even blush, uh, nothing embarrassed them. That they were into everything, every sin you can imagine, until there was nothing left that could cause them embarrassment. Uh, they were that wicked, and, and uh, so. Uh, uh, here, uh, Daniel then uh, begins to uh, recognize that shame, and, and he feels that shame. And verse 9 says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. And uh, have, there again he says, We and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God, but walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and burned and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice and the curse and oath that were written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Uh, started to stop earlier, but I wanted to, to mention um, the, there where it says um, in verse 11, refusing to obey. Uh, I mean, obstinance. Um, you know, many times they were, uh, Israel was called a stiff neck piece people. Um, I, I grew up on a farm and a uh, small farm and we always had a uh, cow and a uh, milk cow and, uh, sometimes some other animals. Uh, my dad, I can remember he used to listen to uh, the farm report on the radio and, uh, uh, they'd always try to predict, uh, because we had a fairly large family. And they tried to predict what prices were going to be the most expensive in the coming year. And so if uh, if pork was going to be expensive, uh, and so that we didn't have to buy pork, then we'd raise a few pigs. Uh, and uh, we'd raise one and, and kill at least one usually and, and sell off the others then. Uh, and that way we didn't have to pay the higher price for pork at the, uh, at the store. And... Uh, if it was the other way around, if uh, if beef was going to be higher the next year, then we raised a beef cow. And uh, 
but we always had a milk cow. And so um, we sectioned the, the pasture wasn't all that big, but it was sectioned off. And at uh, one end, we had uh, water on one side. The other side had no water in it. Uh, and so my dad would have me to go down there a lot of times and, and take the cow over in the middle of the day, uh, maybe a couple times a day sometime, and uh, take her over to the other pasture, let her get the water, because then take her back to the other one because it had more grass in it. She'd eat up what was there. Um, I could, um, it was always a battle, always. Uh, and, and that's the way it is with us. You know, God wants to bless us. And so many times we refuse, just like the children of Israel here. And so uh, we, uh, I would get a, a chain and uh, uh, hook it onto the cow's altar, and uh, we'd do pretty good as long as I could keep her from getting her head turned away from me. Um, and she'd always try to turn. Uh, she didn't want to go, even though it's for her own good. She's been out there all day with no water. And it's for only good that we go back and, and, and get some water. And she's uh, fighting me the whole time. And uh, as she turns and tries to go the other way, as long as I could keep that neck bent and keep pressure uh, to where she couldn't straighten her head to go the other way, it didn't matter about her body. If I could keep that head turned, uh, I still had control of her. But once she ever got that head straightened out, that neck straightened out, and stiffened those neck muscles, there was no turning her. Uh, she dragged me all over that, uh, all over that pasture, uh, go wherever she wanted to go, and that's the same with us. Uh, we stiffen our neck up, and and we're going to go where we want to go. We're going to do what we want to do, and that's where people are at today. They reject God. And uh, they don't want God's um, guidance. Uh, they don't want to recognize him. And, and I'm convinced that many people that claim to be atheists or agnostics even, that um, it's not that they don't believe in God uh, most of the time. They're actually God-haters. They hate God for trying to tell them that they can't do certain things. They can't do whatever they want to do. Uh, that they can't do just anything and uh, and get by with it. God's got uh, his rules. He's got his he's got a nature. And uh, the rules that he set are, are in line with his nature. Uh, and so when we disobey those, uh, then then it's sin. And so, um, yeah, it was always a battle. I'd go over, and of course, once I got that cow over there to the, the water trough, oh, she'd drink and drink. She's probably glad I brought her over there by then. But um, it, like I say, it's every, every time is always a battle. Uh, you know, just, uh, just a little more right quick. Um, and so um, we we'll see that um, go through 11 there. Um, verse 12 says, he has uh, confirmed his words which he spoke against us, against our rulers who ruled us, by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Uh, now, where's that uh, it talks about uh, uh, written in the law of Moses? The law is written there. Look at Leviticus chapter 14, verses 14 through 17. It says, but... If you will not listen to me, and this was when they're still in the wilderness, before they ever took the land of Canaan uh, and moved in, but if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my face against you and you shall be struck down before your enemies, those who hate you shall rule over you and you shall flee when none pursues you. 
And so uh, that was the law of Moses. There's more to it than that, but that's enough. Uh, you can see that uh, what God said he was going to do. And uh, I want to tell you, God keeps his promises, both good and bad. Um, and so, you know, if, if he promises good, then we can count on his promises. Uh, if he promises evil, if we do something, then uh, you better believe then uh, with, it's going to happen. Um, there's a verse back in the Bible somewhere in the Old Testament that says, be sure your sin will find you out. And um, uh, it's, it's not going to be kept in the dark. Uh, God knows all about it, and uh, he's going to make right. And it mentions in here several times about God's righteousness. And uh, so that's what he goes by, his righteousness. That's what he compares things to. And so, um, uh, you know, we can either go his way, and if we go our way, then uh, there's a price to pay. Someone uh, made this statement years ago uh, that... Um, and I've got it written in the front of my Bible. A lot of other people do too. Um, that sin will take you further than you ever meant to go. It'll keep you longer than you ever meant to stay. And it'll cost you more than you ever meant to pay. And that is so very true. Uh, I can testify to it. Uh, a lot of other people can. And so you can go on the way that you want to if you want. But we need to repent, and uh, we need to call upon God. Um, America needs to call upon God, just like Daniel did here. Um, and repent. America is a proud people right now. Um, they got a taste of, of, of victory. They prayed for God to do something. Uh, for leadership, and and I believe God moved, and uh, I think He, I think we repented just enough that God said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and grant you this, but um, you're on trial, uh, a trial basis." I don't think we've lived up to it. I think we've actually become proud and arrogant um, through that victory, and and stood humble. And God says, "I resist the, the the proud and give grace to the humble." And so I think America right now needs to uh, humble themselves, humble ourselves. Uh, and I'm here in Chesnadia, Romania, but I'm still an American. And so uh, I, it's time. I, uh, the Sunday before this past Sunday, this is, um, I'm doing this on uh, Tuesday. Uh, the 16th of March, and um, not the Sunday, this past Sunday, but the Sunday before that, and I've got it on video, uh, and I made an appeal uh, that on uh, the coming Sunday, which is this past Sunday, that every church in America need to fall on their knees, and they need to, to uh, and somebody need to, to organize a National Day of Prayer. Um, I said uh, I didn't have that ability, but I was going to start it if I could. Uh, now, um, I got very little response from it. Uh, but I made a prayer there that someone with more influence in me than myself would um, uh, step up and call for that National Day of Prayer. Little did I know, well, by Wednesday... I come across another video that someone had made about that Wednesday. So it wasn't just me, but other people, um, God was dealing with them too. So it wasn't just me. But Sunday, um, excuse me, Saturday, uh, then the president came out and he made a proclamation that the next Sunday would be National Day of Prayer, the 14th of uh, March. And uh, so... Little did I know when I said, <laughs> when I asked and I prayed that God would raise up somebody uh, that had more uh, appeal than I did, that more, um, uh, I guess, know-how and, and the authority or whatever to do it, to come up, little did I know it, be the President of the United States. So, 
and many churches followed suit, I think. Um, but I got very little response when I first called for it. Um, and I, how much repentance went on in those um, meetings, I don't know. I can't say. I'm not going to say one way or the other. Only God knows. But I just don't think as a whole that America is yet there. Uh, right now, the, the what to call the SARS CoV uh, 2 virus is uh, making its way. Um, it's already moved through much of Europe. Uh, started in China. People reject that, but uh, Wuhan, China, um, and Italy then became very hard hit. And I've watched uh, on social media, I've watched uh, people in America say it's nothing, it's just a cold. It's nothing, don't worry about it. I'm sitting over here in Romania and I'm seeing what's happening in the countries around and uh, how fast it's spreading. And my prayer is that America would be spared, but um, I'm, I don't know. Um, you know, God does things like this. Now, I can't guarantee that God's one that sent that virus. Uh, regardless, of that, and he didn't create it. Well, in a sense, maybe he did create some. But it was created in uh, uh, they suspect possibly in a lab. I lean more towards the what you call a wet um, market where they had all kind of animals in there that's mixed together that should never be that close proximity crap crowded into a nasty filthy place. And um, I can see where some virus like that could get out of there um, and uh, mutate to a, a human virus. But regardless of where it started, that's not the issue. Uh, God often uses things like that to get our attention. But uh, all I've seen is complaining. Uh, very much a little, very little call to prayer. Um, uh, uh, finger pointing or either it's it's uh, oh we're going to be wiped out about it or, or either oh it's nothing it's just cold uh, don't pay attention to it um, they're just trying to create hysteria well some of them were but it went from one extreme to the other but anyway enough here I'm still calling America you need to repent I don't think we're there yet Got an election coming up. We think God's just going to hand it to us. Well, you can see the way things are going. That, that may not be the case. Things can collapse in a heartbeat. When we get arrogant and proud, uh, it doesn't matter how good things are looking, they can collapse in a hurry. And God knows how to do that. Go back and look at uh, um, King Nebuchadnezzar. Massive empire, rich. No sign that anything could go wrong. And suddenly one day he found himself out in the, uh, among the animals while uh, eating grass. Uh, some kind of mental thing that God put on him. And he said that uh, he was going to be that way until he recognized God, Jehovah God, as the God. And uh, it happened. And um, it happened just like that. So sometimes we think we got things in the bag. We've gone on long enough uh, with this section, but uh, Dale Little, Rescue America Ministers, Chesterfield, Romania.